From Sarasota Memorial, this is HealthCast. A healthy dose of information from experts you can trust. Hi, everybody. Welcome to HealthCast. I'm Heidi Godman. In this episode, we're going to be talking about chronic breathing conditions and how to manage them. In particular, we'll find out about emphysema, chronic bronchitis, and asthma, which all fall under the umbrella term chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, or COPD. Also, new treatments and new clinical trials underway at Sarasota Memorial Hospital to help people breathe easier. Our guest is Dr. Kirk Volker, a pulmonologist who's also board certified in internal medicine and critical care, and he's the director of clinical research at Sarasota Memorial Hospital. Welcome. Thank you, Heidi. I'm so pleased to be here. So let's talk a little bit about these conditions. So uh, chronic obstructive pulmonary disorder, I think COPD, people think of that as one kind of condition, but really it could be any of those that I listed, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, asthma. What are they? Right. It's it's really a a group of uh, disorders uh, that uh, cause problems with getting the air in and out. So you think of it just as a getting air in and out type problem. So if you've got asthma, um, the problem is, is that your airway is narrow and you have a problem getting the air out because the, the straw that you're breathing through is narrowed. Um, emphysema is something a little different in which the lung uh, tissue is destroyed and it presents with the same problem of getting the air out. Chronic bronchitis is this thing where you produce a lot of uh, mucus and stuff and maybe have some emphysema. But they all overlap. Uh, into this thing called COPD, chronic obstructive pulmonary disease. Now, um, you can have asthma and be a smoker and destroy some of your lung. Uh, You can have, be a smoker and have uh, chronic bronchitis and you can have emphysema. And we can talk about all that, but you can, you don't have to necessarily have one of them. You can have two of them or three of them. So it could be any combo of them. Then yep. when, when you hear COPD, it's referring to one, two, or three of those conditions. Yeah, it's, it's sort of just uh, lung problems getting the air in and out. What about causes of these conditions? Because smoking has to be a big, big risk factor. Yeah. So um, if we're looking at emphysema, uh, emphysema is actual destruction of the lung. And if you look at the lung, it looks like a sponge when it's uh, healthy, and it's got these little holes in it, and that's the little alveoli that do the breathing. Uh, When you smoke, it actually dissolves part of the lung. It's like taking acid and pouring it on the lung, Um, and then what's destroyed never gets back. Uh, And what happens is that if you look at smokers, okay, as time goes on, we all lose a little bit of lung function. That's just the process of uh, growing older. Now, God gives you twice as much lung as you really need, and that's why people can have a whole lung removed for lung cancer and still do fine. Um, But if you start getting below that 50% line, you start feeling it. So if you've destroyed more than 50% of your lung, uh, you're going to start feeling it. Now, if you're smoking, uh, you start deteriorating that lung at a faster rate. I tell my smokers with each and every puff that you take, you're killing a few of those alveoli. And so you can actually see that, you know, the normal rate of lung deterioration is at this level. When you smoke, it goes down faster. When you stop smoking, it goes back to the regular rate of deteriorating. Now, the lung does not rejuvenate, and some people think it does, but it really doesn't rejuvenate. Um, Like I said, those areas that have been destroyed are destroyed, and they're not coming back. What about what you're smoking? Because, you know, in some states it is legal to smoke things that are not just tobacco. Mm -hmm. What about vaping? What about e-cigarettes? Do all of those things have the same impact? Yeah, that's that's a really good question. And the easy answer is that we don't know. Okay, so we have a lot of data on cigarette smoking, right? Because over, you know, decades and decades, we've seen the damage to that. And But with vaping, you know, that's something that's, that's brand new. I mean, relatively new over the last decade. And now we're starting to see some of the significant uh, side effects from that. Um, anytime you put an oil and inhale it into the lung, the lung can react. It has potential to react against that in something weird called a lipoid pneumonitis. And it just gets all inflamed. Uh, and that's what's happening to these, these kids that are doing the sort of the uh, CBD or marijuana-based uh, oils that they're vaping. The problem is, is that the FDA 
does not have strict regulation of what is contained in these, uh, these little pods that kids are vaping. Uh, so we really don't know. Uh, where they're not required to go through strict testing. They're not required to go through any models. Um, we just don't know. They're, they're allowed to just say, we're going to put nicotine, which is the addictive part of anything. We're going to put that into something and then have the kids inhale it so they get addicted to nicotine. And that's really all they're, they are only interested in getting those patients or kids addicted to nicotine. So do you think that this means we're going to see people developing COPD at younger ages moving mm -hmm. forward? We don't know. I mean, we really don't know that if somebody, well, okay, let's take asbestos, okay? It took us, it takes 40 years for asbestos to show up in the lungs. So back in World War II, the people that were, you know, working on ships and had asbestos exposure, we didn't see that until 30, 40 years later. So this is a question mark That's now That's a question that I'm not going to be able to answer. Right, yeah. right. But let's talk about some of the other causes because exposure to smoke, whether you're inhaling it or maybe whether it's, it's something else that you're being exposed to, mm -hmm. air pollutants. We right. have a lot of cities with big air pollution. Uh, genetics. Tell mm -hmm. us about how those play into different COPD diseases. Sure. Well, um, exposure to, let's say, pollutants. Okay, let's say you, you lived in Los Angeles in the 70s. Uh, if your lungs are predisposed to be a little twitchy, they've got a little bit of asthma, uh, it can set off that twitchiness and uh, this sort of chronic inflammatory process. Now, asthma, I mentioned, was a disease of the airways. It, lo it uh, clamps down the airways. It lowers uh, or increases the resistance. Um, if the lungs are exposed to an irritant, over a long period of time, whether that be vaping smoke, whether it be uh, a pollutant, they start getting inflamed and that starts scarring those airways down and gets this permanent fixed asthma. So that way people may have been exposed to cleaning solvents or something over a long period of time. It can affect their lungs and cause this fixed asthma that doesn't respond to medications. Now, the other thing is about genetics, okay? Uh, some people, in, in my passion is in smoking cessation. And so I always get patients that will come to me and say, well, look, my dad smoked, you know, two packs a day and he died at age 90, you know, without a lung problem. It has all to do with your genetics because two people can, best friends can start out at age, you know, 15 smoking a pack a day. And by age 50, one of them's dead from emphysema and the other one goes to 90. So you just don't know. Yeah. There's something called alpha-1 antitrypsin, which is a genetic uh, sort of defect in an enzyme uh, that makes people more predisposed. But that's just one that we know about. Uh, and there's a whole, probably a whole series of things that we just don't know. So genetics play a huge por uh, part in that, as they do in everything. So it's a predisposition, but you don't necessarily know what's going to trigger exactly. it. Yeah. What about the symptoms? How do you know if you have asthma or mm -hmm. chronic bronchitis or emphysema? Yeah. So... It's a breathing problem. So, you know, when people have problems with emphysema, it's, a, it's continuously there. They have problems carrying in their grocery bags. They have problems walking up a flight of stairs. Um, with asthma, it is a little bit more episodic. They'll get an infection. They'll have a hard time breathing. Uh, they'll be exposed to a perfume or something. They'll have a hard time breathing, but then they get better. Um, but they, there is a significant overlap in those in the airway inflammation. All right. So it could be, what about a cough? Could that be something yeah. that is a sign there is, There's a, a cough variant of asthma uh, that just presents as a cough. Uh, for uh, emphysema, uh, you know, our, our smokers have the smoker's cough. But once, uh, once they stop smoking, the airways can still be distorted which leads to a cough. And bro chronic bronchitis is defined by having a cough for most days out of the, uh, the week. So how do you tell the difference between these different COP conditions and what's involved in diagnosis? Yeah, well, okay, so when people come to me with a, I'm short of breath, and first you sit and listen to them and, and you try to noodle out, you know, exactly what's going on. And then we have lung function testing in which we look at how well does the air go in and out? Do you have something called air trapping? And in these patients, and I, I try to explain to family members that are not affected with lung disease, that if you were to sort of take a normal breath in and then try to breathe above that, you know, it, you feel like, okay, the, the air's not going all the way down. Right. That's how they feel every day. 
Um, you can't breathe in enough. That they, they cannot get the air all because, the way down. But isn't it true that this, those sacs, they're not releasing the air that they have in them? Is that right? right. That's all the, that air trapping type stuff. The because, trapping. Because the airway is being narrowed, they can't get it out fast enough. So you do a, a breathing yeah. test. Yeah, so we do a breathing test. Uh, we An x-ray is so-so. A CAT scan is really good in showing us in patients with emphysema areas of the lung that have actually been eaten out and destroyed. And what about bronchoscopy? Do you need to do that no. to make a diagnosis? We No, you don't need to do bronchoscopy. It's all about the, the air going in and out and, and what the meat of the lung looks like. All right. And when it comes to treatment, there are various ways that you can go about it. Obviously, for asthma, you're going to be doing an inhaler. Mm -hmm. And I mean, we, we hear about children with these kinds of things. Actually, yeah. I have mild asthma. It rarely acts up. Uh, but so that is something that's that can be very manageable, or it could be very difficult to manage. Just let's talk about asthma for a right, second. Yeah. So just taking asthma, uh, like I said, asthma is more of a disease of inflammation. Uh, so the the main goal is to address that inflammation, calm down that inflammation, and that's why we use these inhaled steroids. And there are newer medications uh, against uh, a certain uh, thing called IgE that are shots and, and really help people out uh, that have a certain type of asthma. But it's addressing the inflammation and then addressing the airways that are narrowing down with something we call a bronchodilator. So it's, it's all inhaler-based medicine. And there are a few um, pills uh, a singular that that will help with the inflammation too. What about chronic bronchitis? Okay, chronic bronchitis is usually because of smoking, and it's um, the lining of the the bronchial tubes have these little mucus producing goblet cells, and it produces too much of that stuff. So this isn't like the chronic or like the bronchitis you might get in the winter. No, well, it's, it's sort of the bronchitis that you get in the winter is an acute reaction to that virus or you know exposure of whatever you happen to get. Um, and then your lungs get all riled up and produce a bunch of junk. This is that same thing, but in a chronic inflammation going on a longer period of time, and it's present most days out of the year. Okay. So what about treatment? So for tr uh, treatment of chronic bronchitis, traditionally what we do is the standard inhalers uh, that we use for emphysema uh, that we'll talk about next, and uh, maybe some antibiotics occasionally as they start to flare up. Is that manageable? It's manageable. Um, we don't have a lot of great um, solutions for it on the market yet. All right. So maybe a little more manageable is asthma than chronic bronchitis? Yes. Okay. And then emphysema. Traditionally, mm -hmm. what's been the way that you've treated yeah. that? So emphysema has always been treated with inhalers. The major progress over the last decade has been going from an inhaler that we used four times a day to an inhaler that we used twice a day to an inhaler that we use once a day. Um, now that inhaler that we use once a day now contains three different medicines or two different medicines that work at keeping the bronchial tubes open. Um, Is it making those uh, air sacs in the lungs release the air that they have in them? So by opening up the bronchial tubes, it lets the air go in and out faster. Mm. And so, yes, people feel better. You can take in that big deep exactly. breath. Exactly. It's making me need to breathe just listening to it. And and now the really exciting news is that at Sarasota Memorial Hospital, you have a new treatment for emphysema, a newer treatment. Tell us about lung volume reduction. Yes. Um, so dating back to when I was a pup in, in my fellowship, uh, we were starting to do things um, in people with emphysema. Like I said, there are certain areas of the lung that are sort of eaten out. Now, that's not the same in everybody. Some people, it's diffusely eaten. But in certain patients, it's like the upper lobe is, is eaten out and, and totally worthless. So when I started, what we were doing was a certain surgery where they go in and they cut out the bad part of the lung. That allows the air to go to the good part of the lung. And that good part of the lung that's being smushed by the bad part of the lung to re-expand and people would breathe better. The problem is, is that we were doing major chest thoracic surgery on people who were, couldn't breathe to start off with. Very invasive. So, yeah, so they, they, we had all sorts of problems with that. So what's happening now? So they came around with a, uh, an invention that Sarasota Memorial has been involved with over the last 10 years, essentially, uh, from almost since the, the inception. Um, 
in which they would go with a bronchoscope, which is just a simple scope. It's a procedure where we, we knock you out in, in the bronchoscopy suite. We go with the scope down into your lungs, and we put these little valves in. And these valves look like maybe little umbrellas. And they block the air from going into the bad parts of the lung, direct it into the good parts of the lung. And because that area with the bad parts of the lung are blocked from having the air, they actually, it closes down. And that allows the good part of the lung to re-expand. So same result as what you were doing yeah. years ago, but much less complication. Exactly. All right. So that's one thing that you can do, and that's mm -hmm. making a big difference for patients? You know, it's, you have to do it on the right patient, okay? And that's where the key is. I mean, the procedure itself is, is not all that complicated. And we've got a, a great interventional bronchoscopy team at Sarsa Memorial with Dr. Seaman um, and myself putting these valves in. The problem is is finding out who is the right person, who's going to benefit from that. Who would be the right candidate? Yeah. So first of all, you have to have emphysema that you've got a, an area where the, the lung is eaten out, and you've got a terrible area of the lung that we can just knock out. Um, but there's sometimes communication between, let's say, the top of the lung and the bottom of the lung. Um, and so trying to find that right person that doesn't have communication uh, between the top and the bottom, you have to look at CAT scans, and there are other tests that we can do. So it's all about evaluating the patient and trying to see who is the best candidate. All right. So that is something that is called lung volume reduction? Right. Okay. So if someone were interested in it, that's what he or she would ask about. Exactly. Lung volume yes. reduction. And, and if you if they're going, you know, people are going to go to the internet and Google this, uh, Olympus uh, makes the spiration um, valve. So if you look at, you know, maybe Olympus, that's easy to remember. Or lung valve. Lung valve. All yeah, right. Well, that's yeah. that's really yeah. exciting that now, it might other, make a difference. I'm sorry to interrupt, but the other part about this is that these valves are removable. So let's say you get this done and you say, no, I think my breathing is worse with this. Well, then we go back and we just pluck them out. Incredible. Yeah. So that, is, that really gives you... Uh, peace of mind if it's not necessarily going to work too well. Exactly. Uh, all right. So then there is more exciting news at Sarasota Memorial. Mm -hmm. You're you're the head of research, and there is something else going on with emphysema research that has to do with radio frequency. Yeah. Tell us about it. So we've been using something called radio frequency ablation in the heart for a long time uh, to sort of knock out the nerves that that cause the heart to be too excitable. Okay. Uh, some very ingenious uh, docs uh, have come up with a thing that there are nerves that go down, uh, follow the trachea and the main bronchi, and cause the uh, constriction of the bronchial tubes, uh, and also cause increased secretion of uh, some of these uh, goblet cells and mucus production. They found that if they go down with a bronchoscope and knock out these nerves, this vagus nerve and the nerves around um, that it opens up the airways. And so it's something different than a medication. You know, I, I think of it as sort of beyond the inhaler, the next step beyond the inhaler that we've it's used for decades. going in and zapping it. It's going in and zapping it, exactly. I remember covering that uh, years and years ago, maybe, mm -hmm. I don't know, 20 years ago, mm -hmm. 15 years ago, for, for mm -hmm. heart procedures, trying to zap away atrial fibrillation. So right. now to use that in another application is very exciting. But that's just in the, the study phase, right. right? So right now, the there are only maybe six centers in the United States that you can have it done. It'll probably grow to about 18 um, in the next year. And Sarasota is one of them. Sarasota is one of them. Sarasota is actually a gem for uh, innovative procedures for people with emphysema. Uh, we're probably one of the top hospitals in the United States, and people just don't know about it's it. It's right here on the Sun Coast. I know. And then more exciting news, too. I want to fit this in, uh, that you are studying something which is the opposite of radio frequency, which is heat. Then it's cryoablation, which is cold, mm -hmm. for chronic bronchitis. Tell us about that. Right. And so for people that uh, those goblet cells and their, their um, airways produce too much mucus, we go in there and we freeze them and sort of knock them out so they're not producing all that junk, and then people breathe easier. All right. Well, that's that's all very encouraging, and and it's, I think, something that people can take a little hope from. Um, but what about the prognosis? Mm -hmm. Even with these procedures, what are we looking at if you have COPD? Okay. Well, if you think about it, it depends on how much of your lung you've destroyed. Um, and I'm talking about the, the emphysema because the emphysema is the actual destruction of the lung. Um, and so there, basically, if you, the, okay, out of all the medicines that we have, okay, we have 
billions and billions of dollars of research on medicine. And the thing that really, the only thing proven to make a difference in your mortality is to stop smoking. Stop smoking. It's that simple. It's so important that we have these treatments and medications and ways to manage COPD because right now there is no cure for COPD. But it sounds like there's hope. So what's the prognosis? That's exactly it, is that the medications that we have do not cure COPD. Uh, but with the research that we're doing, uh, with the new medications coming out, you know, there is hope that there is an improvement in prolonging people's lives. We definitely know that we're going to improve their quality of life. Dr. Kirk Volker, thank you so much. Thank you. All right, time now, everybody, for today's takeaways. One is when you hear the term COPD, it can mean asthma, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, or a combination of the conditions. Two is that important new treatments are helping people with COPD, and Sarasota Memorial is leading the way when it comes to research and lung volume reduction. And three is if you'd like more information about Sarasota Memorial's COPD program, just call 941-917-7777. Thank you for joining us today. For more information, please visit smh.com. Follow us on your favorite social media network.